Do you know why it's called Taco Tuesday? No, Todd. Why is it called <laughs> Taco Tuesday? Uh, it was because Taco John's was using two T W O for two tacos on a Tuesday was their deal. And now it got switched to Taco Tuesdays. And now everybody uses it kind of like the old traditional Kleenex Q tips, that whole concept. And uh, not surprisingly, other organizations out there not naming other taco in their title names may not really love the fact that other people have a copyright on it. Yeah. Wow, what a great icebreaker. Yeah. That was good. <laughs> well, I guess, so do people in this group uh, do Taco Tuesday? Or is there a meal that you are like every Friday, like meatless Fridays or fish Fridays or things like that? Is there like a day of the week that's always consistent for your meals? I mean, I do Taco Tuesday just because it's easy to remember and <laughs> easy to make. <laughs> so I'm a Taco Tuesday person. I, I was just sharing with the group today, that, that we had tacos on Monday <laughs> and the leftovers will be Taco Tuesday for us again this evening. So, Look at that. but my boys like the concept of the Taco Tuesday. Pizza Friday. Yeah. Pizza Friday is good. I, I, I don't do those, but I do, for whatever reason, love to order delivery pizza when it snows like crazy. Ooh. I do good tip one. well when it snows, though. <laughs> Food delivery during a snowstorm, that's clutch, man. Mm -hmm. Do you tips? do the same if there's like a rainstorm too? It's like they have to go out in the rain and get soaking wet to deliver your pizza? Um, I don't know that it crossed my mind in the past, but okay. snow, absolutely. Sure. Well, we're not talking about snow for a long time because it's now beautiful oh weather. So it's out of our, our vocabulary. Matthew, did you taco Tuesday? Matthew, or, yeah. No. Or any my, kind of meal. Ours are, ours are too erratic. It's really just whatever's taken us for the, the next couple of days. So I suppose the only thing would be uh, we do uh, lasagna for like big, uh, big celebratory lasagna is kind of our thing, which uh, yes. I've spoken about my love for lasagna on other podcasts. So I'm going to stop before this becomes the lasagna podcast. <laughs> I don't know that might be my new favorite episode, but I'm with you that I'm like, I don't know. Grady, my husband does most of the cooking. So whatever he's cooking is whatever I eat on whatever day of the week. Um, but I also. Whatever he puts in front of you. Yeah. I'm like, I've ordered ingredients to make vegan tacos and then I've just never gotten motivated enough to shred up the tofu and actually do it. So it's on the wish list that one day I'll try making vegan tacos. Nice. Nice. Well, kind of related as we're talking about <laughs> food and we can make yeah, I, can't, Hang in there. I can't do it. I don't know. I don't know. Well, today on our Tech for Business podcast, uh, Kelsey, Tara, and myself are joined by Todd, our CIO and CISO, and Matthew, our GRC analyst. And we're discussing uh, why doctors are refusing to use MFA. And I thought it was so interesting looking back. We're about a year out from our first MFA podcast and we're still talking about it. So what's the deal? Why are they not using it? Why are people not buying in? What's the disconnect happening here? Um, well, mildly interesting and not directly related to healthcare, but I actually was just at a banking conference earlier, um, so I guess it was last week, and they were saying the adoption rate of MFA is still only 17% nationwide, and that was not specific to industry, but nationwide, and that seems low to me, um, but mm -hmm. somebody, somebody slung that stat, so I, I think the answer is is because the adoption still stinks on it, which is probably a great topic for today. Um, you know, I'll take a first stab at it. I think the reality of why that MFA is is so heavily resisted is because people think it's it's complicated, it's cumbersome, it causes them to do something else that's very inconvenient. So um, again, dating myself a little bit like I tend to do on some of these podcasts. When I first started an, uh, a job well over 20 years ago, I had implemented MFA at that particular location, and it was the old FOB. So you had the rolling six-digit 
key card that kind of came in. So you type in your password and then you had to dig the key fob out of your pocket. You had to look at it and you had like 10 seconds to enter it before it expired. And it was just painful. It was ungodly. <laughs> People hated it. But MFA really isn't like that anymore. Yeah. Uh, I mean, for me, the experience I've had with people who are not implementing it, it's it's not going to happen to me. You know, that they're, they're thinking that they're not a target. And so the that the implementation and, and teaching staff and then, you know, training the staff, updating staff, getting hardware, software changes, implementation, the whole project seems like an unnecessary either expense or time sink. Um, that, as Todd just said, kind of used to be the way it was. There was no real better way that was commonly available. Um, I'm sure we all remember the movies that came out in the uh, late 90s and early 2000s of people suddenly having, you know, extra badges and, you know, eye scanning and fingerprint <laughs> scanning. And that all seemed at the time like it was science fiction. Um, and now there's uh, so many different things we can do that kind of fall in line with that. <laughs> they can make it not just difficult, uh, not just easier and less time consuming, but also I don't want to say it's a little fun, but there are times when it does feel a little bit fun and spy-like to use MFA in certain ways. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I guess I'd throw in a couple of barriers to entry, and you did mention a few of them. One of them that we see an awful lot, especially in the healthcare industry, is that there still tends to be a lot of shared accounts. And there is a little bit of inconvenience in how you set up multi-factor for a shared account. So it could just be we'll just say nurse as an example, but it happens in senior living and so on and so forth as well. But you say the login is nurse one, nurse two, nurse three, and you may have 20 people that do it, or you have people coming in to do it temporarily or whatever. There still is ways to do it. So that's one barrier of entry. Um, as we talked about, the inconvenience factor was one in the past. And then the third one that I think that I see come up often is cost. I don't have the equipment, therefore I have to invest in it. Um, which um, kind of actually has a, a mild tangent to another one that we typically see often when you have those shared accounts, especially in like senior living is you'll say, hey, I want to use a tool like your phone where I can use an authenticator. And the the, the staff member will often say, well, I, you don't pay for my phone, so I'm not going to put your application on my phone. Um, that tends to be real problematic, too. It actually isn't, but it, it it's a barrier to entry. People are like, I don't know how to overcome that. They tell me they're not going to carry a second phone. I don't want to pay for another phone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but, but we'll dig into that a little bit further. But those are some <laughs> of the main barriers to entry as to why people are like, this is just too much. I can't move forward on it. Yeah. Uh, one thing I want to mention quickly before we move past this is I'm not sure if there's a different term for this as it relates to organizations. I know it from software development, but it's the idea of a thing called technical debt. And the idea is that when you're building a program, if someone's requesting something and it needs to be pushed out very quickly, corners are cut. Things are done that wouldn't be done if you had more time. And that results in something being released that maybe was done in a way that's suboptimal. Going forward, if you need to redo that or if you need to do something else that builds from it, you're building and creating from a suboptimal position. And so the idea of going back to fix it becomes more and more expensive from time, human hours, everything and, and cost of paying everyone to do it, as well as the potential of having to take the software down to make the fix. Now, when it comes to I see that a lot and we talk about that a lot in software development, but when it comes to your environment, this may be what's holding what you're feeling when you think about implementing something new. You're thinking about changes that may need to happen to the network, updates that may need to occur, what else needs to be implemented. It can seem really overwhelming. And that's because it's a real thing. It's it's very, very difficult to kind of wrap your head around that, especially if you're unsure on the technical side already. Um, so it's it's something to keep in mind. And it's important to remember that it is something that can be undone. Um, MFA can be put on top of it. It can be worked around. Um, having someone come in who can kind of dig into the system or knows the MFA systems better may be able to tell you that implementing this is far easier than it seems. Um, so it's just just something to keep in mind and everyone's dealing with it. <laughs> we do see it a lot of places. Um, it's still worth looking into. 
Yeah, I, I, I'm going to kind of circle back to one of the things that you mentioned a little earlier, too, is you had mentioned um, that there is the what is my risk level? I perceive that my risk is low, therefore, I don't need to worry about it. And again, I know I've mentioned healthcare a few times or excuse me, I mean, um, senior living and a lot of times people will think, well, it's just senior living. Who cares? The answer is everybody cares. There, the amount of data that healthcare people have both on PII, and, and I'm going to sling some some uh, acronyms around there, and, and hopefully you guys are up to date. And if you're not, we got a ton of podcasts that kind of get into the variety of very ones, but that one's your identifiable information on a personal level. And then there's the PHI, which is health information. And that information is very desirable from attackers. Again, I mentioned I was just at a conference and one of the the guys that was at the conference was big on fraud and he talked about how he could use any piece of data and it was it was basically anything use first name last name and how he could pivot to that and get social security numbers addresses date of birth etc once they start to get that information because so much of it is readily available which is why they keep trying to get it they can buy information for roughly two dollars and then they can pivot and start to create fraud off of it so the short answer is the data itself is desirable because it can be sold. I and mean, if you think $2 isn't very much, it's not. But when you sell 2 million of them at $2 a pop, is worth an awful lot of money. Um, and then again, they're using that to create fraud to generate additional revenue. So that's the core reason why healthcare is such a big concern. And of course, as an individual, people care about their privacy. That would be the other major thrust that comes behind why it's important to protect that data. And um, kind of going back into MFA, why MFA? MFA is what is really protecting most organizations' data for the most part. And if you don't have it, you're probably not very protected. Exactly. MFA is really the – It's there is no you know gold standard. There is no one thing. But the thing that's going to help the most with potentially the, less, the least effort is MFA. Um, and here, here's why. Uh, so MFA, multi-factor authentication, breaks down into this idea that instead of just entering a password and a username, you have three different things that the information could be pulled from. Um, so we call this something you are, something you have, and something you know. Now, the short version of this is something you know is generally considered to be your password, something you are, such as your fingerprint um, or voice recognition, eye scans, et cetera, and uh, something you have, whether that's a, a key card or most of us probably have some form of authenticator on our phone now, even our phone itself, if it's text messages, right? Those three things make up MFA. And the idea of MFA is using one, two, three, six different variations on this, depending on how paranoid you get, to create something that is secure. Um, in certain scenarios, I've actually found situations where people's uh, usernames are also non-standard now. Uh, and so in certain situations where I'm allowed to do this, my username for a you know thing I have to sign up for, especially if it's financial, will be just a random string of numbers and letters as well. Makes it even more difficult to get in. Uh, anyway, um, <laughs> so the goal with MFA is to use two of these things, preferably different from those different uh, sections of those three, something you are, something you have, and something you know, and create a sign-in method that allows the person to do this smoothly with as few steps as possible. The most common one and the one that most of you are probably doing or have seen before, if especially in, in if you're banking via your phone, is probably signing in with a password and then getting a text message for a one-time code or an OTP. This is what most of us think of, and I'm sure all of us who work in this industry, and I'm sure Todd and I have more than enough stories of people telling us, but it's a pain. Um, it's just time consuming. That can be true. It is an additional step. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of things that have come through recently, and not just so much recently, but have become available to more people recently. Uh, that can really streamline this process so that it's not exactly what you think it was before. Um, 
yeah, I, I I had things in mind. I'm not sure I know exactly where to pivot <laughs> off of here specifically, but but I, a wonderful overview. I thought it was fantastic. Some of the things that I had in mind was we, we, uh, Matthew covered it quite, quite well when he talks about the reason why you have it ultimately is it's inconvenient or it's perceived to be. Um, the push was one of the major breakthroughs in multi-factor authentication, in my opinion, that really transitioned it from being difficult and painful to Oh, it just popped up when I signed in and said, is this you? And I hit a button that says, yep, and I'm in. Um, that was a significant progress. Over the years, there have been other things that tend to go on with it, too. So, again, that inconvenience piece, I'm going to make a, a correlation to doctors. Doctors get paid a lot of money. Talk, doctors are very busy. They talk to patients. They go from one thing to the next, and they, they tend to be kind of behind the schedule almost always, right? And they, they don't generally, whatever, you can get into the bedside manner, but they're trying to go through things as quickly as they can, and they perceive that logout process as being inconvenient. This is true in senior living when you're trying to dispense medication and so forth as well as it's complicated. There's a lot going on. They're trying to be as efficient as humanly possible, and this is just slowing them down. Now, when I got into the push concept, the reason why I was bringing that up is because MFA continues to evolve. It's starting to get even more frictionless. There's proximity-based multi-factor. So if you're in the room and you've got a token that's based this way, it'll automatically log you in. Uh, most people in, in healthcare today, if you go to the doctor or the clinic more often than not, and if you're in the U.S., this may not be national or worldwide yet, but if you're in the U.S. more often than not, you're using something like a key card or facial recognition or proximity or something along those lines to for all intents and purposes, they instantly log those individuals in. So if you're talking about the time it takes for them, how many minutes of the doctor messing around with a password, typing it in five times because it's complex, and then throwing a multi-factor in, you can quickly add up hours in a day, thus the reasons why they're unhappy, and you can start to justify the cost with it. What do they make? And I honestly have no idea what the hourly rate of a doctor is, but I suspect it's high. And if I'm wasting hours of their time, the cost is very, very high too. So when we got back into the technical debt, the cost of the barriers of entry, et cetera, once you start removing that friction, you can still get the tools that you need at a reasonable cost, if you will, or ROI, if you need to face it that way. And then you still remove the friction. So it is still possible to move forward. Agreed. Um... You mentioned a couple there, and I'll, I'll mention a couple that I've seen. The key cards that slot into workstations, um, people still need to enter their password, but the additional step of putting in your key card is not very time consuming because it's already there, or it's even noticing that you're nearby rather than having to uh, be, be put in. Um, those things were really common and are becoming more common. I want to remind them, uh, remind everyone from this that just a key card is not MFA. That's just one form of this, something you have, which is your key card. So if you are just using that, if someone could just take that card and use it, that's not MFA. They need something else to keep that security level high. Uh, there is a, an, a solution that I, I implemented previously for a, a clinic um, that in short was a single device that included a fingerprint scanner. So the uh, provider would get to their PC, plug this device into the workstation, put their fingerprint against the fingerprint reader on the device and get into their machine straight away. Uh, providing this to the, the clinic, uh, the first time I showed the doctors, you would have thought they were seeing true magic. <laughs> Before that, they'd been typing passwords, they'd been using MFA on their phones, and there had been um, maybe some issues with providers out here not sending text messages through as quickly as they'd hoped they would. So there was some slowdown where maybe the uh, one-time code they needed via text message wasn't as quick as they'd hoped it would be. Um, so being able to just walk in and, and really not even think about it too hard was an absolute time saver. Uh, and the cost of that alone, like Todd said, the cost of saving the, the sit down at your desk, type your password in, make sure everything comes back up, of just having to do it all in one movement five seconds if you got the USB slot on the right time, <laughs> which with USB-C is even quicker now. Um, instantly made up within, you know, I say instantly, but within a couple of weeks, they probably made back the cost of that project that we implemented for them. Um, we also talk about, uh, you know, fingerprint readers I just mentioned there. There are some 
uh, which are straight out of a Mission Impossible movie. Uh, people uh, registering your gate as you walk through rooms uh, is something that is available now. Um, whether how how widely used it is is separate, but <laughs> there are some clinics that may have that implemented, and especially for certain rooms where you already have to key code to get through it. Maybe this is a better solution for you than additional tools. Maybe you already have a camera system in place that can implement that as well. Uh, th those those are the big ones that I think of. The that solution, that individual card, is still one of the coolest things that <laughs> exists on the market, in my opinion. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think you nailed it. You you really do put in a tool set that allows you to remove the friction, be quick, and still give them everything they're looking for. Um, I also mentioned earlier that there it is possible to still multi-factor shared accounts. So there are tools out there. I know Dual has something that they can work with um, through all the app and whatnot as well through the Windows login system. I'm a big fan of Windows Hello. I think it was a game changer when you started to mix in um, facial recognition with with passcodes and and whatnot. So that that form of MFA was a huge change for me. For what it's worth, at CIT we use a minimum of 15 character passwords, and I know my password inside now. We we keep them around for a year because we follow that NIST standard. I still crank that thing in wrong multiple times a day, and it's annoying <laughs> as can be. So so moving to something that's less friction based, like Windows Hello or fingerprints or whatever the case may be, does make a massive difference, and it it just makes people feel good. So, um, you know, again, touching on various workforce where they can easily get overwhelmed and whatnot something simple like that can be a big difference in their day of just being able to remove a little bit of that pain in their lives agreed it's if the worst part of having to move between your office and the t and the exam rooms and everything is having to sign in every time and more than likely you've heard that complaint <laughs> Uh, this this is probably not uh, it's already slow enough for or why would I want to add additional time to that process? It doesn't have to be an addition to that process. It can be a detraction from that uh, that time. Um, it can be as quick as you're willing to to look into letting it be. Uh, we haven't really covered many of the the NFC or the near field communication proximity stuff. Um, there are a lot of those tools as well. They do tend to require a little bit more on-site hardware, um, but they're becoming more and more common as well. Uh, facial recognition through camera systems as well, the ability for them to recognize you as a first step so that when you do something else, you're through as well. Um, I'll also say, and this is probably a paranoia thing coming through, but it wouldn't be a podcast with me if I didn't mention it. You don't have to stop it too. <laughs> why not try one from every uh, every section and then a separate one as well um yes it may increase time a little bit but you're also getting that additional security um again going back to those mission impossible movies people want to wear masks that look like you no one's going to be doing that on a regular day that's not something someone's going to do just because um but hey Try and come up with a with a scenario where your system and your MFA solution will get around it. Maybe it'll always stop the things that you can think of. Um, if streamlining the process is what's important, still keep that additional security in mind. Uh, maybe you require just a pin code on the computer instead of a full password, along with MFA and a fingerprint, uh, along with you know a, a hardware token and a fingerprint six digits instead of 15 when you've already got everything else in place still a bit of a time saver <laughs> yeah another one that would fit really well into that is conditional access as well and we i don't know if we've ever talked about conditional access but there are certain conditions that you can create that'll allow you to um, add security security layers as well as adding um, or reducing the friction so for example one of the conditions may be the ip of where you're located is the building that you would typically work in. So if I'm working remote, Starbucks, for example, I'm not meeting that condition. I'm denied. I have to go through additional layers of authentication to get in. Um, but that does give you that additional layers that Matthew was talking about. I also wanted to kind of swing back because I know I talked about the the friction of, hey, I own my own phone. I'm not going to put your tool on it. Blah, 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 blah. Um, 
And so typically some of the things that you could do is there's a lot of different ways. One, you can just say, we're going this direction. If you don't like it, we'll buy you a phone, which is incredibly expensive. I wouldn't do that. But sometimes just having that conversation is enough for a staff member to go, I'm not carrying two phones, not a chance. I'll put the stupid app on my phone. Um, other options are, right, so that's free. So that's layer one. It's just free. You could easily get there. And it really is not that convenient. It doesn't have access to their contacts and camera and blah, blah, blah. Really isn't that bad. Um, Number two is kind of Matthew was talking about this, whether you're looking at USB keys or, or key cards or something along those lines, those are relatively inexpensive. We'll use like the UB keys as an example. They're about 20 bucks. You can get them with the near field on them and everything. And so if you bought two of those for an employee, you're looking at 40 bucks and that's way less than trying to buy or pay for a phone. So you can get there now. The more friction you're removing, the more security you're putting in place, the cost will change. Like Matthew said, there is infrastructure that may need to go in there. If I'm trying to go super proximity based, all kinds of other stuff, the cost may change. But again, if you're starting to look at, OK, now that I've reached these higher layer, layers of cost, how am I paying for it? That gets into the stuff we talked about before. How much am I paying for somebody to plug in their password wrong and mess with their phone and yada, yada. So that's kind of the last couple of things that I would throw on there. I'll be quiet for a little bit. <laughs> I'll, I'll add something then that's uh, potentially going to upset some people. Um, Instead of coming up from the, uh, the uh, speaking directly to anyone who wants to do this, as I have, uh, even if your organization hasn't implemented them across the board, you can get these types of devices yourself. Um, CIT does have a way for me to implement mine and use that as part of my process because they planned for this <laughs> and were very nice to let me. Um, but if if you're a physician or if you're a provider who is worried about this and and maybe you're if you're using windows machines whatever it is and you have one already maybe ask maybe you can be that push to kind of implement that internally maybe you can have some others and and discuss with them why it's better um a lot of the tools and i'll call out uh windows hello like todd did allow you to add these uh ubi keys again just to call one out that i know does it to a system that already exists as a type of MFA um, to secure that system better. So there are ways that you don't have to just accept what's in place with your organization, but please speak to your IT team before trying to make any changes, just speak to them first. Um, <laughs> but there is a potential for you to implement something or assist in creating a safer space for you within that environment. Um, something that is just unique to how you use it especially if you're doing things that, I mean, we all do things that are important to us, but if you're working in a space where you're accessing customer data and you're unsure of the security of the network you're in, you can try and increase it yourself. Definitely push for the whole organization, but <laughs> you can definitely start there. Yeah, and I guess as we're probably getting close to the end of here, the one thing that I'll, I'll say, and I've, I've said it in many, many of our podcasts, and I'll say it again, some of the most important security tools you can do is number one, I would start with MFA. Start with MFA, start with MFA, start with MFA. If I had a, a 1A, 1B, I'd throw EDR in there, but we've done that, we've done that podcast too. Um, but it is incredibly important. It is a dramatic increase in security. Start with MFA. Agreed. And uh yes, we're talking healthcare, but also please do it for all your banking. Just <laughs> Just as a PSA for everyone, just add it yeah. to your banking. <laughs> or credit cards for that matter. Or credit cards, yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I liked uh, Todd mentioned earlier in our in our chat our, um, how many MFA uh, tools do you have on your phone? So we'll definitely have to bring that up next time. I'm trying to count how many I have as we're talking like so many for so many different things and so many things for for personal as well so we're talking healthcare we're talking business we're talking banks but just you and your day-to-day -day, it's probably important to look into what an mfa can do for you and what you can use it for um, so thank you thank you todd thank you matthew for joining us today if you have a question if you'd like to learn more about mfa or any other um topics you want us to talk about, reach out to us at info at cit-net.com.
www.citytalkradio.com or head out to our website, cit-net.com slash podcast. And we'll be back next week with an all new episode. 